Today we have Kemi Jonah from the University of Virginia. Welcome to Voices of Innovation. Welcome, Kemi. Great to see you. Voices of Innovation invites big thinkers with bold ideas who are here at the ASU GSV Summit to talk about the influence of technology in today's society and our future of education. I'm your host, Lev Gonick from Arizona State University. Let's jump in. Great to see you, Lev. This is always a highlight of my year seeing you at GSV. Uh, thanks so much. Let's get right into it. You know, obviously, this is a gathering where we were all drinking the Kool-Aid around innovation. But as long as we've known each other, we really need to unpack the innovation question in the context of what can we do both together as universities to take the moment around AI and all of the excitement and, and of course, a lot of the hype and turn it meaningfully into innovation. How do you think about this moment in terms of how universities might work with each other? Well, it's interesting, Lev, because, you know, all the universities right now and we're, you know, two and a half years into this journey, right? Two and a half years into some journey right. and uh, two months into the current administration. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, every university now it used to just be the small ones and the rural ones that we were worried about in terms of demographic cliff and other right. external factors but now everybody is in the hot seat mm -hmm. in some ways and you know as you know rom emmanuel used to say no never let a good crisis go to waste and i do think that we're starting to see leaders across all institutions really start to re-examine what what can we do right can we just hunker down or do we want to try to innovate and grow our way out of the current situation? I think to me, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance because if you're at a research intensive university, right, you've got the big research enterprise right. and then you've got the teaching enterprise. And on the research side, our faculty, all they do is collaborate across institutions, right? I mean, you can't win a big center grant or anything else unless you've got, you know, the best thinkers in that field. Right. Pull together. And so it's but like, ironically, when it comes to building solutions for disruptive technology like AI, we seem to misplace that insight. A hundred percent. Right. And so then you're thinking, well, if we can do that, you know, naturally, organically and, and successfully on the research side, why is there sort of like crickets on the other side? Right. Why are we all competing with each other or trying to be first to market with some big announcement on, you know, AI and we're better than whoever else. So where do you see the opportunity specifically as opposed to sort of generically? Because I think we, we're going to rat it, you know, we're going to violently agree with each other that yeah. this would be a great thing to try to do differently this time. But in the current moment across all the opportunity sets that are there, where could, where do you think we should begin or where's a low hanging fruit for universities to explore partnering together to deliver value to our students? Well, right now, because of all the academic governance regulations, it's really hard, you know, to do course and credit sharing. There are some examples of that. And, um, you know, ASU has been a leader uh, in uh, working with InStride, working with Centana to, right. to, you know, share it. But beyond that, there's sort of this not invented here issue that most universities have mm -hmm. that always puts up a barrier to that. Um, so I, I think that's a challenge. I mean, I think the bigger concern that faces all of us is our course is going to be the best way to do teaching and learning, or are we going to get disintermediated by chat GPT where just like any other website, you don't need to go to the website anymore, right? right. They, they won't need to come take a course. And we've seen some private sector companies in this space really take a beating mm -hmm. in the last few months, right? So I think I hear you saying, listen, both for defensive purposes as well as for the need to be intentional about the offensive opportunities to, again, bring value to our students, uh, whether you're motivated by the fear of being disruptive or you want to, as the case of ASU, certainly, to try to not only be first to market, but also trying to do it in an intentional way I think that, you know, we haven't cracked the code for collaborating together, but it's not like we haven't had some successes along the way. And I don't mean just, as you mentioned, you know, creating new ventures like the Santana venture or the Instride venture. You've got uh, Knoxville, right? So, so again, we've done a lot of interesting things 
to ha to partner with create value for institutions who want to, for example, get in the online game with the University of Tennessee at yeah. Knoxville, mm -hmm. but also you know in things that are kind of building blocks. So you know, it turns out, of course, that you know more than sixty percent of students in this country transfer during their careers. Could we be building out an a, a architecture that leverages AI to make it actually easier for our students? to actually succeed in moving their transfers rather than one out of every two credits actually getting lost in the transfer. Can, could we do something together? Because no one in the market really cares about that right now. It's actually very complicated to do. Well, I, I, it's, it's great that you mentioned that because uh, a good friend of both of ours, uh, Phil Kamarni at Maryville, is actually building some technology leveraging AI right. to do that kind of work. And uh, I mean, I would push back gently, Love. I mean, I do think oh, that- Push back gently, go uh, for it. You know, uh, the universities do care about that because when the students, and we're talking primarily either, you know, uh, transfer students or working adult students, um, when they're looking to take their credit somewhere, they absolutely are shopping for the school that is going to recognize most of their transfer credit so that obviously they have the less Right. There's a ton to of friction. There's a ton of friction in the in the market. So much friction. And also we get bad rap for it because like we're just even within a particular state, you have transfer issues, right? So so there's that. I, I would say one area that I'm interested in, right? Um in term it's less about um cross university partnerships, but let's just even look within our university, right? Let's just start at home, right? Charity begins at home and ask ourselves, well, like, could we have faculty sharing expertise and having it embedded in other faculty courses mm -hmm. like that seems eminently doable today with or without ai ai does make it easier to do some of this automatically right but that doesn't happen much if at all right why not right, right? like why can't we solve for that and allow sort of the best expertise in the university to all be embedded within a particular learning experience, either on demand using AI on the right. fly, which would be super cool, right? right? Or an, uh, another way. But ASU, one of the things that we have been, been doing to create interesting collaboration in the way that you've just outlined, essentially inside, is that we've been taking, I would say, you know, really exciting degree-related course material which we know how to do very well, and that's what all of us know how to do very well. And using AI and using basically um, our workflows to begin to draft, how would you make that available for folks who aren't interested in a degree, but are interested in ways of getting a digital certificate in, whatever the topic is, and you have to translate an academically rigorous course delivery framework to one that is of general interest to the, the broad public or to somebody who's trying to reskill or upskill along the way. And rather than uh, what we've found is it's incredibly difficult as humans to actually edit. And for our faculty who have pride of ownership of their original, very well-deserved scholarly material, almost impossible for them to translate that. Right. And AI is kind of an interesting way of repurposing internal content, which again, could not only be used for the immediate delivery for a different audience, but could also be used by other faculty, to your point. Are, are there examples that, you know, inside, you know, at Virginia that you think of that way? Like, let's just talk about Notebook LM, right? right. Where you can drop a, a PDF of an article in there and it makes a podcast for you that you can listen to in the, in the car right. or but, on your bike ride. It, just to interrupt yeah. you for a second, what ha what's very interesting about Notebook LM <laughs> is that Josh and the team from the Google Labs came to ASU with some original concepts for what, is now at Notebook LM, and they got feedback from the market. They got feedback from yeah. our students to actually say, well, if we could synthesize all of this material, how would you want to actually experience it? And it wasn't in a course. They said, it's in a podcast. 100%. And, that, and Google said, right, we're going to pivot yeah. to that environment. So I, I see that as kind of an, an example of sort of the value of us being sensitive to kind of where the market is and, and trying to use these tools in ways that uh, do support repurposing, because I agree with your premise from a couple of minutes ago, which is that the courses may not actually be the thing for the long run. Yeah, I don't think so. And I mean, look, I think, you know, the work that you've been leading, Lev, at ASU, right? I mean, we're, I don't think there's any question 
where there's a lot of hype, but also there's a Cambrian explosion happening right now, right, of innovation. But I still take a lot of energy away from this explosion of new ideas and new methods, right? Like a podcast, like we didn't have that right. a year and ago. That, and now right? Notebook LM is like, okay, that's the new table stakes. So yeah. now everyone's, everyone's got a version of that. And, you know, it's not as interesting as it might be pedagogically, but it's certainly giving us some insight. Well, now you can ask it questions. Exactly. Right? So now it's not just passive. It can be interactive. And we know from learning sciences that the more interactive you make it, the better, right? right. How are you reading sort of the interest? Is the market getting any more mature in its ability to articulate what skills they need from the university community to create less friction in the translation between the university journey and what happens, quote unquote, next. Although again, the linear path is less Well, real. that's exactly it, right? right like right. you just stumbled onto the exact problem, right? Which is we have this sort of very transactional, throw it over the wall mentality, right? And we've had it for decades. Uh, and I think it's fair to say it's not working, it hasn't worked for a while. Um, and even, you know, I was at Northeastern University before I know UVA, you were, yeah. Yeah. and, you know, everyone talks about, okay, co-op, it's amazing. And it, look, it definitely is meeting the need, but that is still only two bites at the apple, right? You only get two co-ops usually, sometimes three, but usually two. Well, first of all, co-ops don't work for working adult learners, right? I had 2,500 right. working adult learners, bachelor of completion, and we're like, Okay, we they have can't like, put pause on that. <laughs> wait, we got right. We have gold standard co-op for our residential students, and we've got like nothing right. for you know. Then I'm like that. That's not right. That's not equitable. And so, what else can we do, right? But I think the the key point that that you hinted at in your question, Lev, is that this sort of siloed model, right, where we each each side, employers and higher ed, keep pointing the finger at each other for this quote unquote skills gap. I just did a webinar last week about sort of skills gap. And it's like, I went back and asked Google to find like, you know, an old article on it, you know, 2013, they're still like, when are we gonna solve the skills gap? Right. You know, and here we are, oh, skills gap, still here, right. you know? And so, you know, I think the model itself is fundamentally broken. This idea that four years in Dawn or four and a half years in Dawn is gonna serve you at all well. And we know the half-life of skills is turning over, you know, every four years. So, you know, you can start as a freshman, let's say you know you wanna be a computer science major, which a lot of kids don't, but let's say you have the benefit. You walk across the stage for graduation four years later, and something like three quarters of the skills that were in demand, the top 20 skills for that role, software engineering, have changed yeah. in those four years, right? right? So like, and then again, and it, just to be- What so are we gonna do Making it that? obvious, yeah. Yeah. AI is no small contributor to well, that. It's making it like, worse, and that's only been the last two years, right? So that doesn't even take that, yeah. that AI thing into account. So, so my view, Lev, is that the partnership work that we do with industry has to get much deeper and much broader, right? We and and who, who among our industry partners is most interested in taking a bite at the apple? As you say, you know, we've been around this particular conversation for many decades, actually. Yeah. And it, I framed the question in terms of, do you think industry is getting more mature in its no. ability to articulate? So your general view is not, not I, as I much as we might hope. I don't think employers know what right. skills they need. Uh, I think the line managers do, right. right? But I don't think HR does in any clear sense. Look, the skills are changing underneath them as fast as what we just talked about. Right. So we're both in kind of a pickle here, right? Which is we're not, our our structures and systems haven't caught up to the reality of what the clock speed is today on, on these uh, changing skills. And AI, we're still trying to figure it out, although it looks like it's like hockey stick, the rate of change, right? Right, and I don't think it's just for coders. I don't, it's, you know. Oh, for sure, in, it's everywhere. You know, I think Finance, that- Finance, manufacturing, you name it, right? right? The law, I mean, the, everything that, that, is, that is out there. So that, that's why partnerships are so key, Lev, right. is that we're never gonna figure this out. It's standing in our own corners, right? The only way to do this is through really deep code design. Right. And if you can, co-instruction, right? Because the best way to make sure that you're synced up is to have a professor of practice from industry co-teaching with your faculty member and keeping everybody in sync and up to date. I'd like you to look in your crystal ball. You've been coming to ASU GSV uh, for many years. I, I wonder if you look in your crystal ball and you think about the opportunities to leverage partners a year from now, when we get back together in San Diego, where do you think we might actually realize in the next 12 months 
uh, some uh, opportunities to say, you know what, we're building in the right direction. These kinds of activities, which we were successful in doing because we managed to articulate what some of the needs are to help our students. What, what might we see in the next 12 months from where you sit? Well, it's a great question. I mean, on the one hand, I worry that a lot of the startups that we're seeing, um, as creative as they are, don't have much of a moat around, you know, ChatGPT or Claude or whatever, sort of taking over whatever they're doing. I do think that the innovators that have deep educational experience are going to win because they understand the context of the learning and the students. Um, but I, I think, you know, the Cambrian explosion thing comes to mind. I mean, how many more notebook LM style innovations are we going to see between now and next year that you know, broaden the toolbox that we have at our disposal and make us think differently about. And are you are you betting on that? Are you betting that there will be a couple more breakthroughs like that? Oh, absolutely. All right, Cammy, we're going to leave it right there. Optimistic on the on the at the back. We're end, getting the hook. Yeah. As a guy who I know and and actually deeply respect for your insights, thanks for taking a little bit of time with us on Voices of Innovation. Mm -hmm.